Okay, welcome back. Um, it is uh, really a, a privilege to be able to in uh, introduce our next speaker. Most of you all know him. And um, Dr. Steve Cannon is a professor and chair of physio physiology at the David Geffen School of Medicine at UCLA. He is a physician scientist. He attended medical school at Johns Hopkins and completed clinical training in neurology at Massachusetts General Hospital. His research began on, ch on muscle channelopathies, began in 1990, when as a postdoctoral fellow with David Corey, he discovered a defect of sodium channel function, disrupted inactivation, in muscle obtained from a patient with hyperkalemic periodic paralysis. He is known in the research community for characterizing the functional defects of ion channels mutated in periodic paralysis or myotonia for analyzing the consequences of defective channels by using computer simulation of muscle excitability and for creating genetically engineered mouse models of periodic paralysis. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Dr. Steve Cannon. Okay. Thank you. It's terrific to be here, and I really appreciate the invitation and the opportunity to come back. I think this is probably my fifth PPA meeting. My first one was in Niagara Falls, so uh, there you can put the dates on it. And um, every year I try to spread it around with some uh, updates in uh, what we've learned about periodic paralysis, its causes, what you can do to try to mitigate symptoms, or uh, what therapies might be in the pipeline. And this year, for the first time at the end, hopefully I'll get there, um, I'm going to, for the first time, uh, have a little bit to say to, about anderson will syndrome, which um, thus far we really haven't made many inroads on. So uh, I'm sorry that Patrick Cochran wasn't able to attend, but I hope he's out there watching uh, the streaming because um, um, this is out there for him. So let me start. I was... Um, I always modify my talk in response to uh, what I perceive here in the audience, and uh, it was only yesterday that I realized so many are here for the first time. So I want to step back for a second and do a little bit of uh, introduction about uh, periodic paralysis. And as all of you know, uh, it's a member of uh, one of the family of syndromes that are caused by defects of ion channels in skeletal muscle. So this affects the electrical excitability uh, as the nerve uh, communicates with the muscle and says when to contract, this all occurs through a series of electrical events. And when there are inherited problems in the, the molecular machines, the biological switches that allow this electrical signaling to occur, one of two symptoms can arise from this, either involuntary after contraction or stiffness that uh, your physicians call myotonia, or intermittent uh, failure of contraction that you experience as weakness uh, or periodic paralysis. And, you know, these disorders, although rare, you know, one per hundred thousand or something like that, have been recognized for a little bit over a century and a half. Um, and clinicians have noticed there were distinct groupings. So some people would either have only myotonia that might be present from birth, hence myotonia congenita, or only episodes of paralysis, sometimes associated with low blood potassium or high blood potassium. And so all of these distinct uh, clinical entities were defined uh, way before we knew the basis uh, of these disorders or, in fact, that they are ion channel diseases. So starting at about 1990, uh, it was really the coalescence of a lot of discoveries, uh, the ion channels being cloned, so we, we knew their uh, genetic composition, um, the ability uh, to measure this in humans, that we indeed confirmed what had long been suspected that all of these disorders of uh, inherited myotonia and periodic paralysis were caused by defects in ion channels. And except for this potassium channel that's also in heart and bone, which causes Anderson to Will syndrome to have um, well-explained symptoms in those other tissues, in all of these other cases, these particular types of ion channels, these little molecular machines that let currents flow in and out of a cell to change the electrical properties, are only expressed in skeletal muscle. And so that's why I'm, I'm fascinated to hear the stories 
of how people are having many other symptoms, uh, hypermobility of joints, sensory symptoms, things like that, because we have to really scratch our heads because these particular variations of these ion channels are uh, expressed rather uh, exclusively in skeletal muscle. You know, just comment on that. I think any of you know um, if you're put to bed for any reason, suppose you have the flu or you've broken your ankle, you get constipation from lying in bed, right? So certain mobility changes can affect other parts of the body, and it's probably through connections like this than, rather than direct effects of problems with the ion channels that are causing uh, symptoms in other organ systems. So um, these are the particular types of ion channels. You're lucky that this afternoon you'll hear from Professor Catterall, who really defined the whole uh, stage for biochemically identifying sodium channels and identifying uh, many different types in brain, heart, and skeletal muscle. And he'll show you, I'm sure, some exciting um, new information about the atomic structure of these channels and how that can help us understand periodic paralysis. So I'll leave that for him. But these are the gene names that are associated with these particular ion channels. So these are the symbols you're familiar with um, getting information back from Invitae or other uh, Fullerton labs or others that were um, uh, testing for variants that might be in your family. One of the really curious things about these disorders is you'll see the sodium channel, this NAV 1.4 encoded by the SCN4A gene, is very highly represented in this list. So many different clinical syndromes can be the result of variants uh, in the sodium channel gene. That's been something our lab has worked on extensively because the, the obvious expectation is the consequence of each genetic change is not necessarily the same in terms of how it affects the channel and then uh, consequently how it affects the excitability of your muscle and your symptoms. So we've been working very hard to figure out what is it about these sodium channel mutations that cause myotonia or other ones that cause hyperkalemic periodic paralysis or yet a third group that's associated with hypokalemic periodic paralysis. And of course, part of this is driven by scientific curiosity, but the other is the, the general principle that if we understand the mechanism, that's gonna be the key to have uh, strategically developed therapies or uh, lifestyle changes that can be important for, uh, for intervention. So I want to tell you today uh, some stories about hypokalemic periodic paralysis and uh, anderson will syndrome. And I, again, I thought I'd start out by uh, addressing the question, you know, what's wrong with my muscles during an attack of periodic paralysis? Why do I feel so weak? And I'll start by reminding you uh, the structure of muscle and how it's activated. So this is a view you would have under the microscope. If you were to dissect out a single uh, fiber uh, in your muscle, you have many uh, tens of thousands of fibers in a large muscle like the bicep. But here's an individual one. It has this beautiful striped uh, striated pattern. This is the uh, nerve that's coming and making a special contact. It's the mechanism by which what starts out as a command from the brain and travels down this, into the spinal cord and out the peripheral nerve. The point I want to make is there's a single site of contact with the muscle. We call this the neuromuscular junction. And I want I show you this picture to try to get you to appreciate the scale of the biological challenge here. Because the information is coming at a point in this muscle fiber. It, you know, it's off the edges of this slide. Muscle fibers are extraordinarily long compared to the nerve. So this would extend for hundreds of yards in either direction. And so the challenge is when the, when the message comes and tells the muscle, okay, it's time to contract, in order for that to occur, the message has to be transmitted or propagated rapidly and with high fidelity across the whole length of the fiber. And that's why electrical signaling is important, because to simply release a little chemical message and wait for it to passively diffuse by random motion, it would be way too slow and unreliable. And really, that's where this electrical signaling evolved to rapidly send information along muscles or nerve fibers or to control the regularity of your heartbeat. And you saw a little of this uh, yesterday from Jack, which is a cutaway view. If you took this fiber in cross-section, just to say there are uh, a lot of elements and a, a bit of a complex situation to get the information not only to travel down the length of the fiber, but radially into the center 
where this electrical event will cause the release of calcium, which is the signal that allows the actual contractile proteins to slide past one another and contraction to occur. So what happens in periodic paralysis is there's nothing wrong with the nerve. There's nothing wrong with the way the nerve talks to the muscle. The neuromuscular junction is fine. It's all the electrical excitability of the muscle fiber itself is where the problem resides. So let me show you what that looks like uh, schematically uh, in a simulation to sort of put a face on it. So what I'm showing here in this graph is a computer simulation of electrical excitability in the muscle. So along the x-axis here is time. It's a very brief period of time, 30 milliseconds, so, you know, uh, a 30th of a second. And along here is this electrical signaling, uh, which we measure as a voltage. And when your muscles are relaxed and at rest, it's as though you have a battery that's charged up and waiting to go. You have to be sitting there, poised, uh, ready to uh, have this signaling event occur rapidly and with high fidelity in order for the system to work. It turns out the polarity of this is that your battery's a little bit negative. It's about a, about a tenth of a volt. Doesn't sound like much, um, but it's a very powerful uh, mechanism for this electrical signaling that happens in biological systems. So what we're showing here is that this would be at rest, your battery is charged. When it's time to go, um, there'll be a little stimulus shown here in this computer simulation by this pulse. And what happens is a very little initiating event turns into a large electrical signaling. This is a signal. This is what we call the action potential. Very large, rapid change in voltage. That's the signal that tells the muscle it's time to go. That's what you're having trouble with in periodic paralysis. So in between attacks, when you're asymptomatic, this is what's going on. With an episode of weakness, your battery is partially run down. Okay. That's the problem in all forms of periodic paralysis, whether it's hyperkalemic, hypokalemic, thyrotoxic, Anderson to every type of periodic paralysis that we know of all has this final common pathway where the problem is maintaining your battery. It's partially run down, and what that does is it desensitizes, or what we call inactivates, the sodium channels, uh, a lot of which Professor Catterall's lab figured out the mechanism of. And with those channels being desensitized, the system is no longer able to respond appropriately when the next stimulus comes. It's so-called refractory, and that's the problem. There's a failure of the signaling because your battery is partly run down. So the whole game in research into periodic paralysis is understanding why these different gene defects in different ion channels cause your battery to partially run down. And why is that connected to things like changes in potassium or temperature or exercise? That's really the focus of, of what we're working on. Now, just to finish off the story on electrical signaling events in these channelopathies of muscle, of course, there's the other end of the spectrum where instead of losing the ability for an electrical signaling event, instead of being having reduced or inexcitability, there's excessive excitability, which is what happens uh, during an episode of myotonic involuntary contraction. This is uh, one way in some patients of eliciting myotonia with the reflex hammer. Uh, if you tap directly on the belly of the muscle, there'll be this persistent dimpling, which is uh, abnormal, and that represents a condition of enhanced excitability of the muscle which with that needle electromyogram, you've all heard those discharges that are happening. This is what it looks like when recorded electrically. So setting the stage now, I want to tell you two stories. One about hypokalemic periodic paralysis and the other about Anderson to Will syndrome. And as I've introduced before, but I saw there were a lot of hands of people attending this meeting for the first time, I'm going to set the stage about the fundamental problem that underlies hypokalemic periodic paralysis and its leaky channels. So I'm going to introduce this in an electrical sense, and I think Professor Catterall is going to show you this afternoon in a structural sense where these leaks are coming from. So really nice uh, segue here for that follow-up. So what's really interesting about hypokalemic periodic paralysis is initially um, even studying patients and having muscle biopsies to look at in the laboratory Scientists did not know which ion channel was at fault in hypokalemic periodic paralysis. So it was through 
classical studies in families of uh, looking for genetic markers and how those segregated with affected versus unaffected people. And that landed us on the calcium channel, a particular calcium channel that's only um, in skeletal muscle. And this channel is actually regarded as a sort of a sensor. It detects when one of those electrical events has occurred and it's part of the chain of messages to say it's time to release calcium inside the cell. So when a lot of mutations were found in hypopp in the calcium channel, the scientists, the physiologists were really excited because, oh, this is a really important channel. But we were scratching our heads because the primary problem was the excitability of the fiber, not how that excitability is read out and turned into a, into a calcium signal. So we were stuck for a number of years trying to understand where hypopp comes from. And then, again, from work with families, there was a large Canadian family who had all the features of hypopp. So during spontaneous attacks, the potassium was low. You give an insulin and glucose challenge, you can trigger an attack. There's no myotonia. Everything looked like hypopp, except this family had a variant in the sodium channel which was against the rules back then. This is around 1999, because as this started out, um, the first mutations for hyperkalemic periodic paralysis were sodium channel mutations, and the hypo were calcium. And the world was simple, different channel, different clinical phenotype. But uh, real world biology is always uh, more richly complex than that. And it's now firmly established that sodium channel mutations can cause hypopp as well. In North America and Europe, about 20% of hypopp patients will have a sodium channel mutation, whereas about 60% will have a calcium channel mutation. One, there were a couple of um, big advances that came because of this observation. One, is these little, so you've, we're introduced today that these cartoons are showing, um, representing the barrier between the inside and the outside of the cell, so-called plasma membrane. So down here would be the inside of your muscle cell, and on top is the outside. And this string represents sort of the bead, the string of pearls of the amino acids that make up uh, the protein that's the ion channel itself. And each of these colored symbols indicates the location in which a variant has been identified in a family with hypokalemic periodic paralysis. And um, in biology, as in other um, disciplines, we use shorthand so we don't have to write everything out. So these single letters are referring to the name of the particular amino acid that would be changed. And what you can see is when you look at all these lists, all of these are beginning with the letter R. In fact, all 11 in the sodium channel start with a little R, and eight out of nine in the calcium channel. That means the genetic variants are changing arginine mutations. These are amino acids that are very special because they have a permanent positive charge. It's how the channels can respond to voltage. And this was just astounding. There are over 20 amino acids. Why should it keep turning out to be arginine over and over and over again in hypopp? That is not coincidence. That's telling us something about uh, where the defect is arising from in these channels. And about this time when we were focusing on uh, not only the fact that they're arginines, but they're also in a special place, a, a special uh, alpha helical segment that's like a spring coil that goes across this membrane. It's in the voltage responsive part of the ion channel. And other investigators were studying how this voltage responsible element moves. In other words, how can this little molecular machine be sensitive to the membrane potential in order, the voltage of the cell that is, in order to carry out its function? And people were studying how much it might move, where it moves, and how it is it can slip in and out through the channel protein. Professor Catterall will tell you more about that. But the bottom line was if you have a variant there, if you put in the wrong amino acid, then this, it doesn't, the machine doesn't fit together as well. So this moving cylinder has to slip in and out through a sleeve in a very coordinated, tightly controlled way. And if you have a variant there, you could actually cause some of the ions to slip through the channel where there shouldn't be a leak at all. And uh, we tested for this, so did Professor Catterall's lab actually at the same time, uh, by um, 
expressing these channels in frog eggs, so the relevance of, of biology to help in human disease, which seems very unconnected to periodic paralysis. This is a wonderful system to inject the genetic message to cause these eggs to dutifully make mutant channels. They'll be in the membrane, and we can use some electronics to record those currents. And what we in Professor Catterall's lab showed is that normally you're looking at, again, time. We're making the electrical measurements. This is the current. You don't have to worry about the details, but you can see they're very different between what a normal sodium channel does and one with these mutations. And what you're seeing here, it's farther away from zero, means it's leaking ions. It's a leaky channel. And that was the big insight about what might be going on here, why the defect wasn't seen before, and why it is that mutations in either the sodium channel or the calcium channel, two very different channels, very different functions in skeletal muscle, give you the same clinical symptoms of hypopp. Because these are comparable areas where it's been conservation in evolutionary terms about how these machines are put together. And so, uh, an analogous mutation in either channel causes a similar type of leak. And uh, we and others have verified that essentially all of these cause these leaky channels. So there's the problem. How do you connect a leaky channel to I have periodic paralysis and what can you do about it? So this is where um, we went to animal models. And uh, we, haven't, we haven't gone up across the zebra theme that, that rare diseases in medicine are referred to as zebras hence the zebras out on your tables. So we made a, a hypopp mouse that actually didn't look like this. That's PowerPoint, uh, uh, Photoshop. But um, by having created these mice, we can actually, uh, first of all, test whether a particular variant is sufficient to cause the muscle symptoms in the mouse and try to understand what's going on and how can we do something about it. So as you know, um, Spontaneous events are relatively rare in many individuals with periodic paralysis, and similarly in these animals, they look normal running around the cage. So what we needed to do was to challenge the muscles with things like variations in potassium, which is difficult to do in the body because so many systems are operating, kidneys and everything else, to keep the potassium normal. It's difficult to fight against that, so what you do is actually take the muscle out put it in a nice little bath, and if you zoom in, uh, this is the calf muscle from a mouse sitting there uh, with two little wires that we can apply electrical stimulation and measure the development of force uh, in a mouse muscle fiber. And that's how we look for the consequences of creating an animal model of periodic paralysis. And so what we did was the first mouse we made had uh, a sodium channel mutation associated with hypopp. We studied the muscle um, as we, uh, outside the body so that we could vary the potassium. And here is an attack of hypopp uh, from this mouse muscle. So what you're looking at is the amount of force versus time. And for about a half a second, we electrically stimulate the muscle, which should normally cause contraction, even when the muscle's taken out of the body. So here's a nice, big, robust, forced response in a normal mouse. And even if you challenge it with two millimolar potassium, normal muscle tolerates that pretty well. If you have a mouse that's carrying the, the variant associated with hypopp, if you lower the potassium in this mouse that has one copy of the abnormal variant, um, you lose a lot of the force. So here's a hypopp attack. And if we go back to normal potassium, it recovers. Here's something that um, very rarely, almost never happens in humans, but this mouse has a double dose of the variant. And it survives, and at baseline, the force isn't so great. But boy, when you give this mouse two millimolar potassium, it completely loses the force altogether. So what this is just showing you is that we have a very um, robust system of recreating a human disease, which is an ex outstanding uh, advantage point to be from to think about mechanism and explore um, interventions. We've also made a mouse with the calcium channel mutation, the R528H, which is the most common uh, calcium channel mutation seen. It also has hypopp, so instead of showing the raw traces, I'm just showing you the amplitude of the force over time. So we studied this muscle uh, for a whole hour, 60 minutes, and the force is very stable, and we can measure how well this calf muscle contracts. And then we do the challenge with two millimolar potassium, the normal mice are all up here. They don't mind two millimolar potassium very much. 
If you have a double dose of the variant associated, uh, the 528H variant, there's a pronounced 60% loss of force, and then it recovers if you uh, return to normal potassium. Again, showing that we really have hypo-PP in a dish. And what's interesting is a question was asked here about um, hormones and gender difference. When we studied the mice that had just one copy of the variant, which is analogous to the situation in you all, the male mice had a low potassium attack of weakness, but not the females, which is really interesting because, as I said, the large family in the Netherlands had the same experience, that the women were much more mildly affected, and some of them actually didn't even have episodes of transient weakness, even though uh, they carried the mutation. You can also, in these animal systems, uh, define literally a dose response curve. So how much force will this muscle lose as a function of the extracellular potassium? You'd love to know this, right? You each want to know the magic number. What's my potassium target so I won't have weakness? And so what we're showing here, uh, the wild type mice really tolerate these extremes of potassium pretty well, but if you have a single or a double dose of the variant, this is uh, clearly hypo and not hyper uh, PP here. So we have a very nice model for hypokalemic periodic paralysis. And um, so what we've been working on lately and just published this year is another very curious phenomenon. I've focused on potassium so far. That's what the disease is named for. That's what you all struggle with in terms of uh, taking potassium supplements or other medications to present, prevent potassium loss from the kidney. But Another uh, very common trigger in periodic paralysis is exercise. And so how do you connect exercise to any of this? And, you know, when I talk to people, and I'd love to show, see a show of hands out here, um, you know, exercise is one of the more consistent and, and prevalent triggers that, that people experience. And I don't know if some of you have had potassium levels measured after an exercise-induced attack, but very often the potassium is normal. So another theme I want you to understand is while potassium levels certainly do bias the likelihood of having a failure of excitability and attack of weakness, it's not the whole story. And you can have an attack in normal potassium because other things are happening. And so one of the really curious things about exercise-induced periodic paralysis, at least what the papers say, the research papers, is that Usually you have to exercise for a prolonged period of time, you know, play full court basketball for 45 minutes or something in order to be susceptible to an attack of weakness, not just a quick, you know, wind sprint for five minutes. That long exercise is more problematic and that curiously, you don't become weak while you are exercising. It's after you stop and sit down that then you can't get up. So a child goes out for recess, has fun running around for 45 minutes, come back, teacher says, sit still, be in your desk, boom, attack of weakness, can't get out, out of your chair. So we started from that standpoint, and initially what we were curious about, you know, exercise is a complicated thing in muscle biology because muscle is so adaptive, a lot of changes happen, you know. You heard about the autonomic nervous system already this morning kicking in, um, helping you utilize fuel more efficiently, blood flow changes, a lot of things happen. So there are a lot of potential ways in which exercise could impact periodic paralysis. Um, but we started with the idea that something is protecting you while you're exercising and that carbonic anhydrase inhibitors like acetazolamide and caveus work. So there might be a, a connection in the acidity of the, of the tissue there, the pH. So the idea we had was maybe when you're vigorously exercising and you have that lactic acidosis, that the normal acid that's produced by your muscles as a consequence of metabolism and burning fuel is somehow protecting your muscle. And we studied that and we saw a little effect. If you artificially make the solution the muscle is in a little bit acidotic and you give it a potassium channel, challenge, it's not as sensitive. You're a little bit protected. But something more amazing happened, which this is all in normal potassium, that here, uh, over an hour, we're testing muscle force. Again, our mouse muscle. Here's control, everything's fine, 100% of force. We artificially make the system more acidic. So this is, if you will, artificial exercise for 30 minutes, and all the muscles tolerate it well. 
but when we rapidly return to rest by changing the pH, the two different animal models of hypopp, doesn't matter whether it's the calcium mutation or the sodium channel mutation, boom, huge loss of force, an attack of weakness, if you will, that follows exercise. Curiously, it did not happen in normals, but also it did not happen in hyperpp. Now, I know people with hyperpp have exercise-induced attacks of weakness. It just means something else is going on. You know, biology is interesting. There's another chapter we're going to have to return to. But here is a huge clue for what's going on in hypopp. And I just want to show you how amazingly consistent this animal model is with what you experience. So here's the weakness after exercise. Another thing you've told us is that um, if I slowly warm down after exercise, I can attenuate or sometimes even avoid an attack of paralysis. And so we can test that. So here, again, is the force over an hour. We're testing our muscles. I'm sorry the curve is upside down because I'm showing pH instead of CO2. But here's your simulated exercise. And the idea was at the end of exercise, should we recover the acid-base balance really quickly, which gives us an attack, or maybe more slowly? That's what warm down is, right? Correct the acidosis more slowly. So if we made it a couple of minutes slower, eh, didn't really do anything. But we could make it be much, much slower by controlling how rapidly the pH is changed in our, in our tissue bath. And that completely prevented an attack of paralysis. So you had the risk um, factor still occur prolonged acidosis, which is like prolonged exercise. But if you recover from that acidosis slowly, you can avoid the attack of weakness. So this is providing very strong scientific corroboration of what you've been telling us all along. This is very important to do. And I would just encourage you, these lifestyle changes can make a big difference in how periodic paralysis impacts your life. There's another phenomenon that we recorded that was just unbelievable. So here, we're again simulating exercise with acidosis, stop exercising, boom, you get an attack, and then resuming exercise. Because many of you have told us, if I exercise and I sit down and I start to get an attack of periodic paralysis, if I start like exercise again, I can stop it or reverse it. And that's what happened. So here, you're exercising, you stop exercising, boom, an attack of weakness. OK, let's resume exercising. Whoosh, recovery really, really fast, over and over and over again. So what this means to me is this model is extraordinarily good at mimicking what you experience. So this is going to be an outstanding system to figure out how we can further tweak things to help prevent your attacks of exercise-induced periodic paralysis. So we're really excited about this. In, in HypoPP, um, there are other opportunities for intervention besides uh, the potassium level. And I have to do a little bit of a deep dive to explain that to you. I've already set you up by the fact that all of these uh, events we were just seeing, this loss of force, remember, is in normal potassium. So even though you have HypoPP, there can be other modifiers, other stressors, that can bring out the failure of excitability and the weakness. So what are some of those, and are those opportunities to intervene again? So we have to get a little geeky for a minute here. So this cylinder is representing one of your muscle fibers. And just for completeness sake, I'm listing the little molecular machines, the channels or the pumps or the transporters that bring these salts, these things like sodium, potassium, and chloride, in and out of the cells. And all I want to... Um, to tell you about is that when we account for all these things that we know exist in muscle and help charge your battery and get your battery all set to go, we can simulate this on the computer and look at the consequences of lowering the potassium on how well your battery is charged. And normally, you sit out here at about four millimolar with a, uh, potassium with a well-charged battery. And in normal muscle, if you lower the potassium, it actually makes your battery better charged. Okay, And this happens in, in all normal muscles or when you're asymptomatic. But if the potassium gets super, super low, lower than you would be in your body, at this point you'd have cardiac arrest already, but we can do it on the computer. What happens is this system fails. And one of the channels that's helping to charge your battery fails. It's actually the same channel in ATS. 
and you partially depolarize your battery, and then the sodium channels are desensitized, and, and that's paralysis. So here's how you're bringing in low potassium. So if you introduce these leaky channels that we talked about because of the mutations at those arginines, what it does is it causes this transition between excitable and ready to go and partially run down battery inexcitable, causes that to shift into the low normal range of potassium values. And that's why you have hypo-PP attacks, okay? Because when your K goes down to here, which shouldn't affect normal people, you can depolarize and become inexcitable. But there's an interesting question, you know, if my potassium is three, kind of scary, kind of low for someone with hypo-PP, I could be okay or I could be weak. And so there has to be something else that's setting the bias. Which one of those states am I going to be in? And to make a long story short, it turns out it depends on how much chloride is inside the muscle. Now, you can't approach this by thinking about how much chloride you take in your diet. Sorry, that won't work. But what you can think about is the molecular machines that bring chloride in or take chloride out of muscle. And it turns out what's bad for you is if the chloride is high in the muscle, that's going to bias the system to be up here and be inexcitable. Well, why would we go onto a geeky thing like this? Well, because these are targets for manipulating the chloride inside your muscle. And so you can use drugs like bumetanide, which is a diuretic that inhibits this co-transporter that brings chloride into the muscle. And so you should bias the system to be low chloride, which should be beneficial, and that's what happens. Here's our exercise-induced attack of paralysis. If we treat with one micromolar bumetanide, it completely prevents that attack of weakness, showing the importance of, of the chloride balance in influencing the consequence of being at risk for paralysis uh, because of exercise. There's another thing that uh, I'll show you that we haven't uh, published yet, which is that this little player that's bringing chloride in, which could be a problem, normally this is set up to help your body respond to whether you're dehydrated or well hydrated. When you're dehydrated, your cells could shrink like little raisins if you didn't have a mechanism to compensate for that. And that's what this guy normally does. And so what happens is when you're dehydrated, the activity of this transporter ramps up like crazy. So that's going to bring chloride into your muscle and could be a problem. Conversely, when you're well hydrated, it suppresses the activity of this transporter and that could be hugely beneficial to you. So the question is, are normal achievable levels of hydration in all of you a clever way to try to minimize the episode of periodic paralysis? And astonishingly potent, absolutely yes. So here we're again, this is unpublished, looking at the exercise-induced loss of paralysis. Both of these traces are from the sodium channel hypo-BP mouse model. Again, in, in normal hydration state in blue, you get the post-exercise weakness. Um, uh, this is osmolality for the physicians in the audience, but a 7% decrease in the salinity of your blood, very mild change in hydration, completely prevents your susceptibility to that attack of weakness. Conversely, 7% drying out, worsening, making the salt concentration higher. First of all, just that load itself is activating that transporter and beginning to cause an attack even before you exercise. Exercise, here's the recovery from a partial attack. That's the recovery exercise acidosis thing I was telling you about. But importantly, then, when you stop exercise, if you're behind, you know, dehydrated, wham, you have a huge attack that's much worse. So by studying these animal models, we can really provide you with lifestyle recommendations that can make a huge difference in your attacks of weakness. Now, I've spoken for 40 minutes. Jake, we're scheduled to go to 11. I have about a 10-minute Anderson to Wealth thing that we could do at a different time, or I can keep going. We have, I, I mean, I kind of budget for 11 to 30 in questions, so. Okay, all right, if I see, see people sleeping, I'll dance or something, something. Okay, so Anderson to Wilf syndrome, uh, Louis Patachek's lab found the first mutations. It's in a potassium channel several years ago, but we really haven't made as much headway, but I've got some new news to tell you. So um, this was one of the first papers by Robbie Tewill, which is why it's now called Anderson Tewill syndrome. First recognition that there were some cases of periodic paralysis that were uh, most prominently associated with uh, cardiac rhythm disturbances and sometimes unusual facial and skeletal hand finger features. And it was initially confusing about 
whether this periodic paralysis in this syndrome was hypo-PP or hyper-PP. This is 1994, and even to this day, uh, physicians and patients are always thinking about, what's the potassium story? What should I do to make my potassium be high or low to minimize uh, episodes of weakness? And in this first paper in 1994, where they uh, described four patients, um, overall, it seemed as though it was a hyperkalemic variant. What happened is three out of four of these patients if they challenged them with an oral potassium load, they got an attack of weakness. So that's how people started regarding this. Same group of investigators now bringing in some Italians and other international patients. Um, three years later, now they had um, 11 patients from five families and reviewed the literature. And what they found is that in these uh, 11 individuals, if you look at spontaneous attacks, sometimes the potassium was low, sometimes it was high, uh, or sometimes it was normal. And they reviewed the literature, which is too small to hear, uh, to, sorry, to see. Uh, but here's a little summary just to illustrate how perplexing this is. So if you say, who looks like hyper-PP for these 10 cases in the literature? They measured the blood levels after an attack seven times. Never had high potassium. They challenged five of these patients with potassium. Four out of five of them had an attack of weakness. So there are elements that look like hyper-PP. Of the seven individuals who had blood samples taken right after an attack of weakness, three of them had low potassium. So they're looking at hypo. And they gave them the glucose challenge, uh, provocative uh, uh, trigger for hypo-PP. And two out of five of them got weakness. Uh, four out of seven had normal potassium during an attack. And one, no matter what you did, you couldn't trigger an attack. So here you can see how confusing it is which makes it a challenge for us to recommend to you what to do in terms of managing potassium to uh, monitor this disease. So as this clinical conundrum was unfolding, as I said, Louis Patachek's lab found a mutation in KCNJ2, which encodes this potassium channel. Here it is uh, in cartoon form in the membrane. Um, what I want to tell you about here is that for this little molecular complex to form, there are actually four proteins that come together, four copies and you're looking down on the top. This is where potassium goes to the middle. These are these beautiful atomic structures. Dr. Catterall is going to show you a lot uh, this afternoon. And these are, uh, every place there's a little symbol is a mutation uh, found in anderson twill syndrome. So the question is, now that we know the mutations in about 60 or 65% of families with ATS have uh, a missense mutation in the potassium channel, can that tell us anything about whether we should advise our patients to keep their potassium high or low. And at first, there were no animal models to do that, so we turned to computer simulation. So again, here we're looking at all the players that determine whether your battery is charged or not. And um, this is a little bit of an esoteric way, but the battery charging is along here. So the farther to the left you are, the better your battery is charged, and this just shows uh, the ions moving in and out of the cell to determine how well charged you are. And this is what you would be when you're normal. What I want to illustrate from this is a parallel between hypo-PP and ATS. So this is the normal situation. We talked about those leaky channels. That's what we did just, you know, 10 minutes ago. If you add the leak to the model, that would be represented by this red line in this diagram. It pulls this black line down. And now it turns out <coughs> your battery could be in three different states, either well charged, or partially depolarized, partially run down. That's where hypo-PP comes from in this model context. Bear with me, I'm going with this just to show you that if you, if you lose this potassium channel in ATS, it's just the mirror image of the hypo-PP problem. In hypo-PP, you've got this bad leak down below. In ATS, you're missing something that should be pulling you up higher. In either case, the consequence is this normal relationship shifts down and you could have uh, a partially depolarized battery. Punchline, doing the math and looking at the science, we thought you should have a hypo-PP phenotype. And that's where the clinical reports started going. And that made cardiologists really happy. Because your cardiologist is going to say, I want your potassium to be high because it's more protective for the cardiac events that you're having. Well, the story is a little more complicated than that. So we've begun to make mouse models of anderson Twill syndrome. So many years ago, people studying this channel for other reasons did the genetic manipulation to delete the gene from the mouse. 
to see how well would the animal do without it. And if you completely delete it, the mouse has a really severe cleft palate, is unable to nurse, and dies within the first day. So that's not going to work. Um, the mutations in ATS, they don't destroy the channel, they alter it. And what happens, I told you the four copies come together and make that complex. There's a phenomenon called a dominant negative effect, where if just one of those uh, proteins, one of those subunits, has the variant, the pathogenic variant, it can trash the whole channel. And so what you'd like to do is introduce a so-called knock-in of a specific mutation. That hasn't been made yet. That's a little bit uh, intensive. Nowadays, it's getting, it's getting easier. But that would take several months of work. A different group um, used viruses. You can, you can use viruses to, as, a, as a method to introduce foreign DNA into cells. So they made a local model of ATS by having a virus bring in um, one of these variants associated with ATS. But they did really limited studies. And with a virus transfer, if you breed the mice, then the effect is gone. So it's not a permanent uh, mouse. And they saw a little bit of a decrease in force, but they didn't look for any potassium sensitivity. So what we decided would be a better way is, is to use some molecular tools that are out there to knock out this channel, to decrease it, but only in skeletal muscle. Because if you could do that, the animal won't have a cleft palate, should still be able to nurse, and, and you'll be fine. And so we did that, and we can knock out either one or both copies of this gene, and the mice are fine. They live, they breed, they run around the cage. So now we have a system um, in which we can study uh, anderson Twill syndrome for the consequences of the skeletal muscle. Of course, this model won't be good for the heart or the bone because the loss of the channel is, is only in the skeletal muscle. And this is just to show, these are the, the normal currents as a function of time that you measure through this channel. And the point is, if you, have, if you knock out one copy, you lose about 30% of the current. And when we knock out two copies, you lose about 70%. Why is there still any left? Well, there are other channels besides KAR 2.1 that are contributing to this. But let me just finish up with the impact. So we're going to take our mice now and say, show me the force. What's happening? So if you just look at the baseline force of the calf muscle, here it is for normal mice. If we knock out one copy, still pretty good. If we knock out two copies, 30% eh, loss of force. So it's looking like we're getting a muscle syndrome in this mouse that might be a good model of ATS. So then the next thing we did was let's do the potassium challenge. And we were all, you know, smart scientists, computer models. It's going to be hypo PP. No. So here's the low potassium challenge. Actually, the muscle got stronger. So this, this mouse with the knockout of, of, of uh, KR2.1 um, did not have a hypo-PP phenotype. If we challenged with high potassium, 10 millimolar, huge loss of force. So this model, anyway, is suggesting that um, the, with this level of dysfunction of the KR2.1 from this conditional knockout in muscle, it's more like a hyper-PP phenotype. Now that, you know, some patients are like that, but we thought about the fact that some patients are also hypo-PP, and as I said, these true ATS mutations in patients, these variants in patients are like suicide subunits. They trash the whole channel, and they potentially make a much more severe deficit in this channel than we've created with our genetic model. And so we used a different way to turn off the KIR current uh, using a uh, block with the barium ion. So it turns out just uh, barium salts are a very potent blocker of this channel. You only need to put in a little tiny amount. And if we put in just enough, we can reproduce exactly what we had in that mouth that we use genetics to partially disrupt the channel. If we do high K challenge, loss of force. Low K challenge, it's just like wild type, it's fine. But what we're able to do now is ramp it up, put a little more barium, cause a little more severe defect. And when we do that, the muscle tolerates this barium. It tolerates a really low uh, uh, potassium uh, conductance in this muscle. But if you challenge it with either high or low K, now uh, it's very sensitive and you get an attack of weakness. So this is now looking like um, what patients are tell us in, uh, telling us about um, in, in ATS. And w w the punchline is, uh, this is why the system is complicated. Uh, we've modified the model, and we can have this um, severity of defect dependent difference. 
And the model is also suggesting uh, interventions that we can use uh, that haven't been tried yet in patients uh, to prevent these attacks. So let me just finish by just going through some real world points of what these animal models are helping us with. So in HypoPP, uh, what we know from the science now is that you're expecting the mutations to be at those arginines in the voltage sensor. So when you get a report back from Invite or Fullerton or somewhere else, uh, looking for HypoPP and you have something that's a variant that's not at one of these arginines, eh, the odds are it's probably not a pathogenic mutation. So knowing this structure function relationship to the ion channels will help tremendously with the interpretation of genetic testing. The other thing I showed you is that accumulation of chloride inside muscle fibers is bad for you if you have hypopp. It can bias you to depolarization and inexcitability, even if you have normal potassium. And so you should do things to uh, minimize chloride coming into muscle. And one of the really important things is stay well hydrated, because that's going to suppress that system that brings chloride into muscle. There's the potential that we could also inhibit this transporter. One of the challenges is the same transporter is in the kidney, and when you inhibit it, you'll lose potassium in the kidney, so that's kind of the flip side of the coin. So please don't run out to your primary care doc and say, write me a prescription for bubentinide. I want to take a truckload of it, because you could get in trouble. Mike Hanna's group is trying a controlled trial. I'm pleased to say that in the small doses that have been used so far, it's unclear whether there's benefit, but there was no um, adverse event in a hypopp patient from taking this medication, but that's, that's still in the pipeline. Uh, the other thing is what you've been telling us, we now, uh, about warming down after exercise, there's good scientific evidence for, and we uh, highly recommend that. For anderson Will syndrome, the cake, the potassium dependency is indeed complicated, just like the early clinical papers started, and that high or low potassium may trigger attacks, and so, you know, Work with your cardiologist, be mindful of their recommendations, but be cautious about being given the message that high K is always good in ATS because our animal models and our computer simulations say not necessarily. So be careful about that one. And stay tuned because these new insights on ATS is going to give us opportunities to intervene. So I'll just finish on thanking a lot of the people uh, who've worked with us over the years at UCLA and Dallas when I was there, our support from the National Institutes of Health and the Muscular Dystrophy Association. So thanks for sticking with it for 50 minutes. I'd be happy to answer any questions. Steve, as always, this is uh, really fascinating stuff. Um, I, I, I'm just going to start with two questions. One, is there any way combining bumetanide to like an antibody or something where you can localize it to the muscle and not to the kidney? You would now have a biologic periodic paralysis drug or something. So Jake brings up a great point that bumetanide is very effective in the dish. Is there a way we can have it act just on muscle? And the thing is this, this trans co-transporter is in every cell of the body because every cell has to de deal with this dehydration and shrinkage problem. And even though these transporters can be slightly modified from one cell to another, we don't have a pharmacologic tool yet uh, where we can do that with that level of precision. But those are things we'd love to think about. I will, I will follow that up a little bit by saying I'm still optimistic about pharmacologically inhibiting this co-transporter. Because, for example, it'd be great for rescue uh, from an ongoing attack, and you could take potassium at the same time. And if you do the math and the, and the modeling, if you think about how much potassium you might lose into the urine because you took this drug, versus how much potassium will shift into your muscle and get trapped there because you're having a hypopp attack, the hypopp effect is huge compared to the amount of potassium you would lose in the urine. So I think this is still a very viable approach but we just need to do it intelligently and not have people go cowboy on this yeah. and have adverse events and then we lose it as an opportunity. Right. If only George Costanza had bumetanide. Uh, <laughs> okay. Uh, and, and then um, th just with ATS and cardiac arrhythmia, so there's the muscle, the skeletal muscle part of things, and then there's the preventing cardiac arrhythmia. So is that all? I mean... Is there any way to look at cardiac excitability? Because the cardiologists are probably making recommendations on the basis of, you know, cardiac rhythm 
Yes, yeah, so the cardiologists, you know, the field of cardiac electrophysiology is a very mature field. They know from the abnormalities in the electrocardiogram what the best candidates are in terms of affecting certain channels and transporters with the drugs that are available. There's a really interesting challenge for the mouse model. So it turns out that in ATS, the big problem is repolarization, so the end of the cardiac action potential because it's a potassium channel problem. And it turns out mice and human are not very similar in that way. So mice use different classes of potassium channels to repolarize the heart rate, and their heart rate is dramatically different from humans. So mouse models are not great for studying cardiac arrhythmias. You have to use like, guinea pigs, rabbits, dogs. So it's much oh. harder to, yeah, I'm sorry. As it's much <laughs> harder to do that, uh, which is why uh, there's been a little bit impediment to progress in that regard. And that's why we didn't also use a molecular tool to put the mutation in the, in the mouse hearts, because we're not optimistic it's going to be a good model. Gotcha. Questions? Uh, that's far away. <laughs> Real quick, um, you said chloride could be a problem, so is potassium chloride pills then not a good idea? Great question, I'm glad you asked it. Uh, potassium chloride pills are fine. So it, it turns out you can't approach this issue through regulating the potassium you take in your diet or with your medications, because uh, there's, there's oceans of chloride outside cells. Really the opportunity is to affect these little molecular machines that bring chloride in and out of the muscle. So please don't, don't try to lower your serum chloride. Um, it, it's, it's acting directly at the muscle that's going to be important. Hi, Dr. Cannon. I have a question um, related to something that happened to me, but while having an episode of paralysis, when I go to have blood draws done, they cause a worse episode of paralysis. Then I ingested three fizzies of 25 MEQs, which sent me into full myotonia for two and a half hours that they couldn't stop. Would the influx of potassium while being paralyzed like that, for whatever reason, send me into myotonia? So um, we started out by describing a hypo PP benefited from potassium, which usually doesn't have myotonia. There are a few rare instances. This would be in one of the unusual cases. Um, but I can, I can try to piece together what you've experienced. So uh, this relates uh, to what Todd Bell was saying this morning. If you have hypo-PP, you're starting to get an attack, you go to the emergency room, the nurse comes at you with a big rusty needle to draw some blood. No, I'm just kidding. Needs to draw some blood. You get anxious, and the sympathetic effect cortisol release and everything can cause potassium to shift into cells and make things worse for a while. So the anxiety of having a blood draw could be why when they're drawing their blood, it's not because they're removing potassium from your body, it's because your autonomic nervous system is causing potassium to move much more rapidly into your muscles. With regard to the fizzy and things like that, um, I can't say for sure. There are some forms of myotonia that are potassium sensitive. Those are usually sodium channel mutations without hypo-PP. The fizzy part could be, you know, a pH change. It's interesting. When you decrease the pH, I didn't go into it today, but a, a big part of all this chloride accumulation is when things become acidotic, it shuts down the chloride channel. So if you're susceptible to myotonia, either because you have a sodium channel mutation or you have one copy of a chloride channel mutation, if you reduce the chloride conductance even further, you could uh, aggravate myotonia. So there could be some connections there, but I I'd need to know more details about your exact molecular situation. So is that why acetazolamide works? You're sh making... So acetazolamide and uh, dichlorophenamide caveus, in my opinion, when, when we test those in these animal systems in the dish, there's a modest benefit. When we test those same compounds at similar levels in the whole animal, with a glucose challenge to cause an attack, they are much more effective. They work beautifully. So I think these compounds are working primarily at a systemic level by influencing the way kidney, the, the kidneys waste bicarbonate when you take these medications. And the acidosis that it creates in your blood is what's protecting you. So if you're on carbonic anhydrase inhibitor and you go to your physician and they say you have hypochloremic metabolic acidosis, I want you to back off on your carbonic anhydrase inhibitor, say no. 
That's what it's supposed to do. That's what's protecting me. So I, I think that's where... And, and, it's, and it's shutting down the chloride channel. So carbonic anhydrous inhibitors do not affect this, this chloride uh, co-transporter. Okay. They, they cause other ways that chloride is uh, lost in, in the urine. If it makes an acidosis that then causes the chloride to shut off. Uh, that part, yes. Yes, Jake, okay. you're right. Doctor, doctor, I'd like to applaud you on your research. As a, uh, as a periodic paralysis patient, it's a long time coming. Thank God for you. We appreciate it. I found uh, mo most interesting your uh, research on exercise relative to a hypo patient and the dramatic drop after exercise and, and the slow warm up. I'm a hyper patient, and you, you mentioned that uh, it, it's very different for a hyper patient. And yet, when I look at my experience with exercise, it sounded exactly the same as the hypo patient. And I was wondering if any research had been done with hyper patients and why it's different, because it sounds similar, if not exactly the same. I agree with you um, that it is. Um, not exactly the same, but the clinical phenomenon is experienced by both, and I'm glad you spoke up about that. So it's still a question mark for us. One of the challenges is in these animal models, how do you study exercise? So you can put mice on a motorized treadmill and force them to run. You can put just a wheel in the cage and they, you know, a mouse will voluntarily run about five kilometers a night just from putting this in the cage. Whereas, you know, in the little shoebox cages that they're in, they get almost no exercise at all. So there are big gaps still in using these animal models and understanding the relationship between exercise. And we're going to have to go back and look at some of these more complicated effects, you know, um, perhaps lactate itself or uh, impact on uh, regulation of other ions across the membrane or upregulation of, uh, of the pumps that act here. We just don't know yet in hypo-PP. We do have a, a hyper-PP. We do have a hyper-PP mouse. We tried some quick things to simulate exercise, and we just haven't seen a dramatic enough episode to, to say, you know, we've got a handle on this now and can explore it. I will tell you that we generated these genetically engineered mice and had to mess around with them for two or three years before we figured out how to bring out these dramatic attacks. They're very robust, no question about it. But just to illustrate the challenges of even when you have these wonderful tools, it takes a lot of work to be able to figure out how to tweak it and, and bring out these events. You, you use the term slow warm up to try to mitigate against the paralysis. What do you mean by that? Um, I'm sorry it went by fast. It was slow warm down. Warm down, I'm sorry. Yeah, so the idea is that after vigorous exercise, don't just stop and sit down. So if you've been jogging or playing tennis or something and you finish, take a walk. Walk around for 10 or 15 minutes. Um, and, and, and don't just be immobile right away. There's another interesting theoretical way in which for a hypo-PP patient, if you're having weakness after exercise, you could try to reverse the situation. You want to make your blood more acid again. You can do that by resuming exercise, or you can do that by rebreathing into a paper bag. So I would be really curious if any of you have exercise-induced attacks, if you, for, you just want to try it, just breathe. Don't put a plastic bag over your head. Rebreathe in and out of a paper bag to increase the CO2 in your blood, and you might find a tremendous benefit from that. I wouldn't expect that for the hyper-PP because the pH doesn't affect those attacks in, in those mice. Now, mice are not humans. You know, it, it, it could be different. But so far, we still need to tweak the system further to study exercise events in hyper-PP. Okay, the, the, the last comment is my, my, my own personal theory is that the difference in body temperature away from the 98.6, either plus or minus, is a significant trigger. And what I find with the with cool down, very honestly, after vigorous exercise, I need a cold shower to put that, to re dramatically reduce that body temperature to mitigate against the paralysis. Even, even a, a walk doesn't do it. Yeah, it's interesting, the temperature effect, because as you probably know, for paramyotonia congenita, cooling usually aggravates the myotonia, and extreme cooling can cause the myotonia to progress uh, to weakness.
So everybody's different, and as, as you've heard many times at this meeting, each individual has to find their own path here for what works best. And I'm glad you all are so open-minded, and I hope your physicians are open-minded as well, because these can make important differences. Quick question uh, with, I guess, practically speaking, what level of hydration, is there any type of uh, formula or standard of hydration that one could aim for based on yeah. body weight or whatever? So this uh, new uh, data that's unpublished is just a couple of weeks old, <laughs> that modest changes in the hydration state can make a huge difference here. So we're playing catch up in terms of understanding in people what kind of lifestyle changes you can do to stay well hydrated. And obviously we have to be careful about this. If you were to drink just free water, even smart water, you know, tons of it, you're going to pee. You're going to pee, you're going to lose some potassium stuff. So we have to think about whether it's hydration with salt replacement. You wouldn't want the sugar because that's going to be bad. What's probably easier to think about is definitely avoiding dehydration. So exercising like crazy when it's hot out, perspiring, not having had liquid beforehand. If you're doing a long run or a bike ride, have hydration with you. If any of you are diabetic, you want to watch out for your blood sugar getting high because that would trigger this system as well because of the uh, osmotic load in, in the blood. But we're actually going to talk to our endocrinology friends and think about what reasonably safe interventions, not just lifestyle, but perhaps medication, might be applicable here to keep the well hydrated state. If, you, if your pee is completely like water or just a little yellow, then you're in a good shape for hydration. Mm -hmm. Hi. Um, so with the exercise, I have hypo and I could manage it. I run. I do okay with that. But mine is with sleep. Like, I don't sleep more than eight hours a night or I'm going to drop too low and can't get out of bed. So do you have any suggestions for that? Um, not yet. So the question is about sleep being another trigger. I mean, all of the, the classical descriptions are a high-risk period for having an attack of hypo-PP is first thing in the morning. And I know several of you told me, you know, you mix up the k light and it's in the cup with a sippy straw right at the bedside in case you wake up weak. And a lot of things change with sleep. There's a diurnal cycle of cortisol levels and other things that could be causing shifts that might contribute to this. Um, I, we haven't explored uh, what opportunities for intervention there might be other than the obvious of interrupting sleep every once in a while and getting up, which could have other uh, untoward effects. So I think it's a real biological phenomenon and we just have to understand better what's happening so that we can think about recommendations there but it's a, it's a common experience. Um, with the mice, I know you said it's kind of hard to get them exercising uh, specifically, but is there any looking into the differences between aerobic versus anaerobic metabolism with exercise and how each of those impacts um, uh, all the metabolism just in general with the lactic acid? Yeah, so we're looking at the different components of acidosis that might be at play here. Because uh, it turns out they're not all equivalent, so uh, excessive uh, CO2, as we've done here, is not the same as organic acidosis with lactate and so forth. So at the, at the moment, we have to explore that, because what we're finding actually is it's, it's the ratio between inside and outside the cell, and there are many different ways to manipulate that. CO2 is very diffusible, so that was a simple way. Um, but you can... Uh, you can even mess around with the pH balance in other ways that will impact that. So I'll have to come back to you next meeting, especially with regard to, you know, should I be uh, having modest carbs before I exercise or, sh or should I be more in a ketogenic mode uh, in terms of how to best protect me? It's, it's not simple. Hi. Um, yeah, I was wondering again about the pH. Uh, I take caveus and melaride and potassium supplement. Um, the pH... Um, I have to take um, uh, sodium bicarb for that, but I'm just wondering, uh, how come I felt so much better when I was more acidic, uh, being hypo? Um, number one, uh, that's part of the question. And number two, uh, how much pH, what's a good number um, that I need to go by? Because I do test myself at home. 
Um, so I guess. Yeah, you're yeah. you're testing the pH of. Uh, well, of your urine. Of yeah, the, urine at home, but I get yeah. blood work uh, done, and my doctor told me that my pH was uh, my acidic uh, level was so high uh, that he my doctor has me on four. 650 milligrams of uh, sodium bicarb per day. So there, there are consequences of long-standing severe metabolic acidosis that can be bad for kidneys and bones and kidney stones and, and lots of things. So it's prudent for your physician to be worried about that. Um, pH is a double-edged sword. So while pH is what sets up the, the condition of having a post-exercise weakness, so it's a bad player, while you're acidotic, it's also protective. So see here, there was a partial attack. You lower the pH and it gets better. So you say, why do you feel better when your pH is low? It's partially protective. So it's a little bit of a balance. Being acidotic is actually going to be good for protecting you um, from other methods that might be related to the chloride channel, actually. What's a high-risk situation is rapid correction of acidosis back to a neutral or, or basic situation. Now, even if you take sodium bicarbonate orally and so forth, the changes are going to be slow. Um, so the medication itself isn't necessarily going to trigger an attack like this. But I would work carefully with your physicians and say, let's focus on my symptoms, not on my numbers. So even if on carbonic anhydrase inhibitors you have a metabolic acidosis, as long as other things are in line, if that makes you feel better, I think that's what you should aim for. I have a question regarding exercise. Over here. Over here to, the, to your right. Okay. To your right. <laughs> right. Okay. You're right. <laughs> yeah. Um, you talked about the... Uh, when you exercise uh, that, you know, go down slowly afterwards, which I do, I've done that all my life, not knowing why, but now I know. Um, but what about the other way? Like if I, if I go too fast, like I run to the bus, like if, if I did right now, I just ran, I would just stop after about five or six steps, my muscle just lock. Is that my tonia or what is that? What, what do you call that symptom? Uh, so what you're referring to as locking, uh, sort of have to see and maybe even verify with an EMG at the same time, because there are individuals who begin to develop weakness and they lock their joints to pre prevent falling and things like that, which is different from, you know, somebody else couldn't passively move my joint. My, my muscles are completely stiff. Okay. Like, they're so hard, it's like rock. Yeah. Um, so that usually is associated with, with, do you have a conventional known ion channel defect that underlies all of this or? No. Yeah. We're working on that. <laughs> yeah. So that's the challenge because there can be uh, increases in uh, muscle stiffness that can be use dependent that might not be electrical in origin. So you could have problems in other systems retaking up the calcium that's been released and things like that. Um, because what you're describing, I can't easily connect the dots uh, in the context of uh, conventional uh, channel defects in, in hypo-PP. Thank you, doctor, for your lecture. Um, I wanted you, I, I don't know if you know the association between the acute crisis and this chronic weakness uh, the progression of the of this weakness and stiffness of the lower limb, like for example, if someone has a more frequent crisis, is is he going to be uh, weaker, or it doesn't matter the number of, of of crisis? And why do I ask this? It's because my father, for example, hasn't had a crisis. I don't know in two years. Here, my grandparent. He never had a crisis in his life until he developed like this chronic late onset uh, subtype of weakness. So, should that people receive treatment nevertheless, or should they only be treated for the acute crisis? Thank you very much. So, that's a great question that we really haven't addressed yet at this meeting. So, this is the uh, permanent muscle weakness that can come um, that 
in the initial descriptions was thought to be a slow, progressive, irreversible change, typically coming age 50 and beyond, but sometimes uh, it could be earlier. Could happen in either hypo or hyperkalemic periodic paralysis. Uh, it's important to recognize that um, sometimes a, a subtle but meaningful decline in performance, like I'm at 80% my normal level, that might be lasting for a week or two is not necessarily this. And this was discovered way back in the 70s when Birch Griggs first started using acetazolamide. So the carbonic anhydrase inhibitors can sometimes really bring someone back up that they don't recognize they've been in sort of this subacute, chronic, not quite at 100%, which you need to be careful not to confuse with the late progressive thought to be um, irreversible weakness. Now, neurologists who looked at muscle biopsies in these situations, the muscle really looks structurally torn up. They're big holes, vacuoles, um, and so it's led many clinicians to have a, I can't say it other than pessimistic view of opportunity for reversibility of that. But uh, Frank Lehman Horn had a patient who was in a wheelchair for a number of years, and he was doing MRI scans with spectroscopy to look at sodium loading in the muscles, and he wanted to see the response to carbonic anhydrase inhibitor. So without any expectations of helping the clinical scenario, they gave this woman carbonic anhydrase inhibitors for her scan, and she got up and walked out of the chair. So you got to be open-minded if it looks like somebody is, is on this course, um, that it's worth a try of a carbonic anhydrase inhibitor and, and working with them. The mouse model doesn't clearly have this. We're working on it. It's unfortunately a really challenging thing to look for because you got to wait for two years and keep them, and it's, it's, it's not conducive to students finishing their projects and getting funding and things like that. So it's been uh, difficult to study. I will also say that your experience in your family is very common about the seeming lack of association between intermittent attacks and development of late permanent weakness. One of the best publications on this is from Terra Lynx in the Netherlands, large family with R528H hypopp classical calcium channel mutation. This is the family in whom many of the women never had a recognized uh, transient attack of weakness. Maybe they were having subclinical events they didn't uh, report or know about. But what happened is later when they were in their 40s and 50s, they began to get the proximal permanent muscle weakness. So I would say having acute attacks is not a necessary event to cause the late weakness. I still have to say as a, as a scientist who studied muscle biology for a long time, it cannot be good to have this massive depolarization and ion shifts. And it, I would say it is prudent to manage your acute attacks as best as possible to optimize your opportunity of staying strong later in life. I'm going to have to second that. Just anecdotal. Um, I guess we, uh, we have to do lunch and we have to do the picture. And I think we're going to do the auction a little later to break up the afternoon later. Uh, so I, I think, um, thank you, Dr. Cannon.